All right, uh, we're back with part three. Landmark decisions of the United States Supreme Court. I like this one. Since it first convened in 1790, the U.S. Supreme Court has been the central arena for debate on some of the mo America's most important social and public policy issues, including civil rights, uh, powers of government, equal opportunity. As the ultimate authority on constitutional law, the Supreme Court attempts to settle disputes when it appears that federal state or local laws conflict with the Constitution. The Supreme Court's decision to determine how America's principles, principles and ideals as expressed in the Constitution are carried out in everyday life. These decisions impact the lives of all Americans. In the following section, you will read about several, several landmark decisions of the Supreme Court that are important to know and understand as a United States citizen. I think uh, Marburg or Holberg uh, versus Madison, John Marshall, delivering the opinion of the court. Uh, while the U.S. Supreme Court wields immense power in determining the constitutionality of federal laws, its authority was still uncertain until 1803. Although most of the framers expected the Supreme Court to perform this essential role, the, the court's authority was not explicitly defined in the Constitution. Chief Justice John Marshall's decision in Marbury v. Madison, speaking for a uh, unanimous court, established the power of judicial review, making the Supreme Court an equal partner in government along with the legislative and executive branches. Executive branches. The Supreme Court now serves as the final authority on the Constitution. Uh, Marbury case began in 1801, during the last few weeks of President John Adams' term as president. Just before Thomas, Thomas Jefferson assumed the presidency, Congress had recently approved the appointment of several new justices of the peace in and around the District of Columbia. President Adams made appointments to these positions, and the Senate confirmed each just one, just one day before Jefferson took office. The Secretary of State was to deliver the formal appointments prior to Jefferson taking office. However, many of the commissions were not delivered on time. One of those appointed, William Marbury, did not receive his commission and immediately filed a suit against the new Secretary of State, James Madison, for failing to deliver it promptly. Marbury went directly to the Supreme Court seeking a writ of, of mandamus, a legal order demanding compliance with the law, to require Secretary Madison to deliver commission. Chief Justice John Marshall was aware that if the court forced Madison to deliver the commission, Jefferson and his administration would most likely ignore it and thus undermine the authority of the courts. The court martial's decision stated that Madison should have delivered the commission to Marbury, but the section of the Judiciary Act of 1789 that gave the Supreme Court the power to issue writs of mandamus exceed the authority of the court under Article 3 of the Constitution. The decision upheld the laws defined in the Constitution, limiting the Supreme Court's power at the same time in establishing the fundamental principle of judicial review. Excerpts. The question whether an act repugnant to the Constitution can become the law of the land is a question deeply interest interesting to the United States. That the people have an original right to establish and for their future government such, as the, such principles as in their opinion shall most conduce to their happiness is the basis on which the whole American fabric has been erected. This original and supreme will organ this original and supreme will, or will organizes the government and assigns to different departments their respective powers. It may either stop here or establish certain limits not to be transcended by those by those departments. The government of the United States is of the latter description. The power of the legislature are defined and limited and that those limits may not be mistaken or forgotten. The Constitution is written. The distinction between a government with limited and unlimited powers is abolished if those limits do not confine the person on whom they are imposed and if acts prohibited and, and acts allowed are of equal obligation. It is a proposition to plain to be contested that the Constitution controls any legislative act repugnant to it or that the legislature may alter the Constitution by any ordinary act. Between these alter alternatives 
there is no middle ground. Cer certain, certainly, all those who have framed the written constitutions contemplate them as, a forming, as forming the fundamental and paramount law of the nation, and consequently the theory of every such government must be that an act of the legislature repugnant to the constitution is void. This theory is essentially attached to a written constitution and is consequently to be considered by this court as one of the fundamental principles of our society. Uh, Plessy vs. Ferguson. John, oh, there's a photo by the way I wanted to share. This is the Chief Justice John Marshall. Okay. Um, delivering the dissenting opinion of the court, 1896. While great strides were made in establishing the political rights of African Americans following the American Civil War, the U.S. Supreme Court delivered, delivered several decisions, most notably in the case of Plessy v. Ferguson, that impeded civil rights efforts in the United States. Beginning in 1887, following the passage of the first Jim Crow laws in Florida, states, began to require that railroads furnish separate accommodations for each race. Jim Crow law, uh, laws sought to restrict the rights of African Americans. They were named after a popular minstrel character in the 1830s. The laws were unfair and by this time segregation was extended to most public facilities. Many saw the extension of segregation into railroads as a further objection of the work that Congress and the federal government had done to affirm the rights of African Americans. On June 7, 1892, Homer Plessy, an African American from the New Orleans, boarded a train and sat in the rail car for white passengers. A conductor asked them to move, but Plessy refused and was then arrested and charged with violating the Jim Crow Car Act of 1890. Plessy challenged his arrest in court and the case was tried in New Orleans. He argued that segregation violated both the 13th and the 14th Amendments to the U.S. Constitution through appeal, the case was heard before the U.S. Supreme Court in 1896 by an 8-1 decision. The court ruled against Plessy, thus establishing separate but equal rule. The separate but equal rule mandated separate accommodations for blacks and, and whites on buses, trains, and in hotels, theaters, and schools. In the powerful dissent, Justice John Marshall Harlan disagreed with the majority, stating our Constitution is colorblind and neither knows nor, nor tolerate, tolerates classes among citizens. Harlan's words provided inspiration to many involved in the civil rights movement, including Thurgood Marshall, whose arguments in Brown vs. the Board of Education helped overturn the separate but equal pre precedent in 1954. Uh, expert, excerpts. In respect of civil rights common to all citizen, the citizens, the Constitution of the United States does not I think permit any public authority to know the race of those entitled to be protected in, in the enjoyment of such rights. In the view of the Constitution and the eye of the law, there is, there is in this country no superior dominant ruling class of citizens. There is no caste here. Our Constitution is colorblind and neither knows nor tolerates classes among citizens. In respect of civil rights, all citizens are equal before the law. The humblest is the peer of the most powerful. The law regards man as man and takes no account of his surroundings or of his color when his civil rights are guaranteed by the supreme law of the land are involved. Uh, West Virginia State Board of Education versus Barnett, Robert Jackson delivering the opinion of the court. And here we had Justice John Marshall Harlan. In 1940, as most of the Europe was at war with Nazi Germany and the United States was increasingly was increasing production at, it, at its war industries in support of Great Britain, a wave of patriotism swept the country during this time. A U.S. Supreme Court ruled in Min Minersville this School District versus Gobetize that public schools were required to salute the American flag and recite the Pledge of Allegiance regardless of personal religious beliefs. Despite the rulings, many students, including the children's Jehovah's Witnesses, the children of Jehovah's Witnesses, a religious group in the United States, continued to resist saluting the flag and reciting the Pledge of Allegiance due to, due to their religious beliefs. 
Many of these students were persecuted for their beliefs and an intense pressure forced the Supreme Court to revisit the issue of First Amendment freedoms just three years later. In 1943, the court heard arguments in the case of West Virginia State Board of Education v. Barnett. This case concerned the requirement by the West Virginia Board of Education that all teachers and students must salute the flag. No, oh, Jersey. Now, just a photo before I move on to the next page. Right. It's a photo of a rabbi and some students. A, vi a visiting rabbi teaching Orthodox religion to children in Jersey homesteads, New Jersey, 1936. Uh, this case was concerned. Uh, like the, in 1943, they heard arguments in the case of West Virginia State Board of Education was Barnett. This case concerned a requirement by the West Virginia Board of Education that all teachers and students must salute the flag as part of their daily program. The refusal to do so resulted in harsh punishment, including in some cases expulsion. After reviewing arguments on both sides, the court revised its original ruling in Minersville School District versus Gabbitis, stating that this required activity violated the First Amendment. Justice Robert Jackson delivered the decision of the majority, writing that if there is any fixed star in our constitutional constellation, that it is that no official high or, or petty can prescribe what shall be orthodox in politics, nationalism, religion, or other matters of opinion, or force citizens to confess by, by word or act in their faith therein. The court's ruling ensured that the right to worship free, freely as long as it does not interfere with the rights of others is protected under the Constitution. Uh, church service on Thanksgiving Day, 1942. Uh, excerpts. Um, the very purpose of a Bill of Rights was to withdraw certain subjects from the vicissitudes vis of political controversy to place them beyond the reach of majorities and officials and, and to establish them as legal principles to be applied by the courts. One's right to life, liberty, and property, to free speech, a free press, freedom of worship and assembly, and other fundamental rights may not be submitted to vote. They depend on the outcome of no elections. If there is any fixed star in our cons constitutional constellation, it is that no official, high or petty, can prescribe what shall be orthodox in politics, nationalism, religion, or other matters of opinion, or force citizens to confess by word or act their faith therein. If there are any circumstances which permit an exception, they do not now occur to us. Uh, Brown versus the Board of Edu Education, 1954, Earl Warren delivering opinion of the court. Since the U.S. Supreme Court 1896 decision in the case of Plessy v. Ferguson, racially segregated public schools were accepted on the basis of separate but equal rule. The separate but equal rule mandated separate accommodations for blacks and whites on buses, trains and hotels, theaters and schools. Many civil rights groups, including the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, NAACP, worked for, to overturn uh, this ruling for several decades. In 1952, the NAACP brought five cases before the Supreme Court that directly challenged the president established in Plessy v. Ferguson. Uh, Integrated classroom. Okay. Um, president established in Plessy v. Ferguson. Due to the divided opinion of the court on whether or not it was possible to overturn this ruling, the justices called for additional hearings at a later date. Following several setbacks, including the death of Chief Justice Fred Frederick Vinson, the Supreme Court agreed to hear each case once again during its 1953 term. The five cases brought before the Supreme Court illustrated that many public schools in America were not providing equal facilities and materials to African American students. Thurgood Marshall, NAACP's lead attorney, argued that the separate but equal rule violated the 14th Amendment to the Constitution, which granted citizenship to all citizens, regardless of color, and provided equal protection under the law. On May 17, 1954, Chief Justice Earl Warren delivered the unanimous ruling of the court, stating that the segregation of public schools was, in fact, a violation of the 14th Amendment, and was therefore unconstitutional. 
This historic decision ended the separate but equal rule that had been in place for nearly six decades. The, six decades. The court's opinion in this landmark case helped expand the civil rights movement in the United States, advancing the idea that every citizen deserves America's promise of equality and justice under the law. Excerpts. We come then to the question presented. The segregation of children in public schools solely on the basis of race, even though the physical facilities and other tangible factors may be equal, deprive the children of the minority group of equal educational opportunities. We believe that it does. To separate them from others of the similar age and, and qualifications, solely because their race generates a feeling of inferiority as their status in the community that may affect their heart and minds in a way unlikely ever to be undone. We conclude that in the field of public education, the doctrine of separate but equal has no place. Separate educational facilities are inherently uh, uh, unequal. Um, Next, Presidential Statements on Citizenship and Immigration The United States has a long cherished history as, welcome, as welcoming country and contributions of immigrants continue to enrich the nation. While our citizens come from different backgrounds and cultures, America, Americans are bound together by shared ideals based on individual freedom and the rule of law. American presidents beginning with George Washington have acknowledged the contributions of immigrants and r regularly spoken about the importance of responsible citizenship. Speaking on behalf of the United States and its citizens, pres presidential speeches are often eloquent and endearing, conveying the feelings of the nation. Following, the following section includes a collection of presidential quotes on citizenship and the important contributions of immigrants. As you read, note that throughout the history, U.S. presidents have expressed a consistent message on, the, on these two themes. This is nice. Uh, you have George Washington. The bosom, the bosom of America is open to receive not only the opulent and respectable stranger, but the oppressed and persecuted of all nations and religions, whom we shall to a participation of all our rights and privileges, if by decency and propriety of conduct they appear to merit the enjoyment. Thomas Jefferson. Born in other countries, yet believing you could be happy in this, our laws acknowledge, as they, sh as they should do, your right to join us in a society con con conforming, as, as I doubt no, no, not you will do, to our established rules. That these rules shall be as equal as prudential considerations will admit will certainly be the arm, the aim of our legislatures, general in particular. Uh, Abraham Lincoln. Let us all at times remember that all American citizens are brothers of the common country and should dwell together in the bonds of fraternal feeling. Ulysses S. Grant. The immigration is not a citizen of any state or territory upon his arri arrival, but comes here to become a citizen of a great republic, free to change his res residence at will, to enjoy the blessings of a protecting government where all are equal before the law and to add to the national wealth by his industry. On his arrival, he does not know states or corporations, but confides implicitly in the protecting arm of the great free country of which he has heard so much before leaving his native land. The United States wisely, freely, and liberally offers its citizen citizenship to all who may come in good faith to reside within its limits under complying with certain prescribed reasonable and simple formalities and conditions. Among the highest duties of the government is that to afford firm, sufficient, equal protection to all its citizens, whether native-born or naturalized. Here, too, for we have all welcomed all who came to us from other lands, except except those whose moral or physical condition or history threaten danger to our national welfare and safety. Relying upon the zealous and watchful watchfulness of our people to prevent injury to our political and social fabric. We have encouraged these coming from foreign country, from those coming from foreign countries to cast their lot with us and join in the development of our vast domain, securing in return a share in the blessings of American citizenship. I want to show you some of the photos. Uh, the top one is you know, George Washington on the left. Uh, on the right is Uly President uh, Ulysses S. Grant. And then... Uh, Thomas Jefferson on the left and Cleveland on the right.
uh, Theodore Roosevelt. The good citizen is the man who, whatever his wealth or his poverty, strives manfully to do his duty to himself, to his family, to his neighbor, to the state, who is incapable of the baseness which manifests itself in arrogance or envy, but, but who, while demanding justice for himself, is no less scrupulous, scrupulous to do justice to others. It is because the average citizen, rich or poor, is of just, is of just this type that we have cause for our profound faith in the future of the Republic. We are all of us Americans and nothing else. Uh, no, this is something I'm not sure. Who, this is somebody else reading now. Uh, we, I mean, this is, this is by somebody else, I think. We are all, all uh, we are all of us Americans and nothing else. We all have equal rights and equal obligations. We form part of one people in the face of all other nations, paying allegiance only to one flag and a wrong to any of us is a wrong to all the rest of us. Woodrow Wilson. This is the only country in the world which experiences this constant and repeated rebirth. Other countries depend upon the multiplication of their own native people. This country is constantly drinking the strength out of new sources by the voluntary association with it of great bodies of strong men and forward-looking women out of their uh, out of other lands. And so by the gift of the free will of the independent people, it is being constantly renewed from generation to generation by the same process by which it was originally created. We have just taken an oath of allegiance to the United States. Of allegiance to whom? Of allegiance to no one, unless it is uh, unless it is God. Cer certainly not all of allegiance to those who temporarily represent this great government. Not certainly not of allegiance to those who temporarily represent this great government. One, one, uh, one second. Of allegiance to no one, unless it is God. Certainly not of allegiance to those who temporarily represent this great government. You have taken an you have taken an oath of allegiance to a great ideal, to a great body of principles, to a great hope of the human race. We came to America, either ourselves or in the persons of our ancestors, to better the ideals of men, to make them see finer things than they had seen before, to get rid of the things that divide, and to make sure of the things that unite. Uh, Warren G. Hardy. Nothing is more important to America than citizenship. There is more assurance of our future in the individual character of our citizens than, than in any proposal. And all of, and all the wise advisors I can gather can ever put into effect in Washington. Calvin Coolidge. American citizenship is a high estate. He who holds it, it is the peer of kings. It has been secured only by untold toil and effort. It will be maintained by no other method. It demands the best that it demands the best that men and women have to give, but it likewise awards its partakers the best the best that there is on earth, nineteen twenty four. Whether one traces his Americanism back three centuries to the Mayflower or three years to the steerage is not a half is not half so important as whether his Americanism of today is real and genuine. No matter by what various crafts we came here, we are all now in the same boat. Franklin D. Roosevelt. 
the principle on which this country was founded and by which it has always been governed is that Americanism is a matter of the mind and heart. Americanism is not and never was a matter of race and ancestry. A good American is one who is loyal to his country and to our creed of liberty and democracy. Harry S. Truman There is no more precious possession today than the United States citizenship. A nation is no stronger than its citizenry. With many problems facing us daily in this perplexing and trying era, it is vital that we have a unity of purpose. To the end that, that freedom, justice, and opportunity, goodwill, and happiness may be assured ourselves and people everywhere. John F. Kennedy Everywhere, immigrants have enriched and strengthened the fabric of American life. Lyndon B. Johnson our citizens, naturalized or native-born, must also seek to refresh and improve their knowledge of how our government operates under the Constitution and how they can participate in it. Only in this way can they assume the full responsibilities of citizenship and make our government more truly of, by, and for the people. Uh, Ronald Reagan uh, it's long been my belief that America is a chosen place, a rich and fertile continent placed by some divine providence here between the two great oceans. Only, and only those who really wanted to get here would get here. Only those who most earned for freedom would make the terrible trek that it took to get here. America has drawn the, studest, the stoutest hearts from every corner of the world, from every nation of the world, and that was lucky for America, because if it was going to endure and grow and protect its freedom for 200 years, it was going to need to stout hearts. I received a letter just before I left office from a man. I don't know why he chose to write it, but I'm glad he did. He wrote that you can go to live in France, but you can't become a Frenchman. You can go to live in Germany or Italy, but you can't become a German or an Italian. He went through Turkey, Greece, Japan, and other countries, but he said anyone from any corner of the world can come live in the United States and become an American. George H. W. Bush Nearly all Americans have ancestors who braved the oceans, liberty-loving risk-takers in search of an ideal. The largest voluntary migrations in recorded history, across the Pacific, across the Atlantic, they came from every point on, on the compass, many passing beneath the Statue of Liberty, with fear and vision, with sorrow and adventure, fleeing tyranny or, or terror, seeking haven and all seeking hope. Immigration is not just a link to America's past, it's also a bridge to America's future. William J. Clinton More than any other nation on earth, America has constantly drawn strength and spirit from wave after wave of immigrants. In each generation they have proved to be the most restless, the most adventurous, the most innovative, the most industrious of people, bearing different memories, honoring different heritages. heritages. They have strengthened our economy, enriched our culture, renewed our promise of freedom and opportunity for all. They together, immigrants and citizens alike, let me say, we must recommit ourselves to the general duties of citizenship. Not just immigrants, but every American should know what's in our Constitution and understand our shared history. Not just immigrants, but every American should participate in our democracy by voting, by volunteering, and by running for office. Not just immigrants, but every American on our campuses and our community should serve community service breeds good citizenship. Not just immigrants, but every American should reject identity politics that seek to separate us and not bring us together. George W. Bush America has never been united by blood or birth or soil. We are bound by ideals that move us beyond our backgrounds. Lift us above our interests and teach us what it means to be citizens. Every child must be taught these principles. Every citizen must uphold them. And every immigrant, by embracing these ideals, make our country more, not less, American. America's welcoming society is more than a cultural tradition. It is a fundamental promise of our democracy. Our Constitution does not li limit citizenship by background or birth. Instead, our nation is bound together by a shared love of liberty a conviction that all people are created with dignity and value. Through the generations, the Americans have upheld that vision by welcoming new citizens from across the globe, and that has made us stand apart. And then you have...
I'll just back up and quickly do some of the photos. I think I did this one, but... Uh, prominent, no, 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 the president before President Obama. Throughout our nation's history, foreign born men and women have come to the United States, taken the oath of allegiance, and contributed greatly to their new communities and country. The United States welcomes individuals from nations near and far, and immigrants have played an important role in establishing this country as the land of, of opportunity. America takes great pride in being known as the nation of immigrants. The following section provides examples of individuals who have come to the United States, become citizens by choice, and left a lasting impression on our society. This list is by no means all-encompassing, as comprehensive record would be nearly impossible. Instead, it serves the purpose of highlighting a selective of foreign-born Americans coming from a wide range of countries who have had a significant impact on the United States as we know it today. Um, you have John Paul Jones, 1747-1792, American Naval Officer. John Paul was born July 6, 1747, in Kirkbean, Scotland. Now, Dumfries, Dumfries in Galloway, Scotland. At age 21, he commanded his first ship and quickly became a, a very successful merchant skipper in the West Indies. In the mid 17 70s, he moved to the British colonies in North America, adopting the last name Jones. At the beginning of the American Revolution, he joined the Continental Navy and was commissioned first lieutenant. During the war, Jones commanded several vessels, including the Duc de Duras, which he renamed Don Paul Homer Richard in honor of Benjamin Franklin's Poor Rich Richard's Almanac. Aboard the ship on September 23, 1779, Jones engaged the British vessel, vessel HMS Serapis off the coast of England. Jones defeated the HMS Serapis in one of the most storied battles in the United States naval history. He is now entombed beneath the chapel of the U.S. Naval Academy in Anna, Anna, Na, Annapolis, Maryland. Um, Alexander Hamilton, 1757-1804. First Secretary of Treasury, serving under President George Washington. Hamilton was born January 11, 1757, on the island of Neves, British West Indies, now part of the independent country of St. Kitts and Nevis. Hamilton moved to America in 1772, where he attended preparatory school in Elizabethtown, New Jersey. At the outbreak of the American Revolution in 1776, Hamilton entered the Continental Army in New York as a captain of artillery. In 1777, he was appointed aide-de-camp to General George Washington. Hamilton was one of the three men responsible for the Federalist Papers, and was a guiding spirit behind the adoption of the U.S. Constitution. With the adoption of the Constitution in 1877, Hamilton uh, like all other residents of the new nation, became an original founding citizen of the United States. He was also a founder and leader of the first political party in the United States, the Federalists. William A. Leidersdorf, American businessman and the first Amer African American diplomat, Leidersdorf was born in the Danish West Indies, now the U.S. Virgin Islands, to a Danish man and an African woman in 1810. He was raised by a wealthy English plantation owner and obtained a formal education while in the Danish West Indies. Upon his caretaker's untimely death, he moved to the United States, uh, settling in New Orleans, Louisiana. He became a naturalized U.S. citizen in 1834. Leidersdorf became an active in the mercantile, mercantile industry and soon developed a trade route between Yerba, Louisiana, now San Francisco, California and Honolulu, Hawaii. In 1844, while living in California, then part of Mexico, he became a Mexican citizen in order to increase his land holdings. On October 29, 1845, Thomas O. Larkin, U.S. Consul in Monterey, California, 
appointed Leidesdorf a vice councillor at Yerba Buena. Leidesdorf secretly helped the United States annex the region of California. His service as a vice council lasted until the U.S. occupation of Northern California in July 1846. Um, let me show you the pictures. This is Paul. This is um, John Paul Jones, the first person. Uh, this is the ship. And then we have him, William A. Leidersdorf. And they don't have a picture of Alexander Hamilton in this one. Um, Alexander Graham Bell. American inventor introduced the telephone in 1876. Bell was born in, in March 3, 1847, in Edinburgh, Scotland. In 1872, he moved to the United States where he taught at Boston University. Bell became a naturalized U.S. citizen in 1882. At an early age, he was fascinated with the idea of transmitting speech while working with his assistant, Thomas Watson, in Boston. Bell shared his idea of what would become the telephone. In 1876, Bell introduced the telephone to the world at the Centennial Exposition in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. The invention of the telephone led to the organization of the Bell Telephone Company. Bell was also responsible for inventing the photophone in 1880, an instrument that transmitted speech by light rays. In addition, he was the co-founder of the National Geographic Society and served as its president from 1898 to 1904. Uh, Joseph Pulitzer, Pulitzer, 1847-1911. This is a picture of Bell. American newspaper publisher Pulitzer, Pulitzer was born in April 10, 1847 in Macau, Hungary. He immigrated to the United States in 1864 to serve in the American Civil War. Joining the 1st New York Cavalry, Caval Cavalry Pulitzer began his newspaper career as an employee of a German language daily in St. Louis, Missouri. He became a naturalized U.S. citizen in 1867 after buying two St. Louis newspapers and merging them into the successful St. Louis Post-Dispatch in 1878. Pulitzer, Pulitzer purchased the New York World in 1883. He shifted the newspaper's focus towards human interest stories, scandals, and fighting corruption as the world's circulation grew from 15,000 to 600,000, the largest in the United States. Before his death in 1911, Pulitzer pledged money to set up a school of journalism at Columbia University in New York, as well as the, as well as the Pulitzer Prizes for Journalists. The Pulitzer... Pulitzer Prizes are now considered the most prestigious awards in print journalism. Francis X. Cabrine, 1850-1917, American humanitarian and social worker, first U.S. citizen to be canonized by the Catholic Church. Cabrine was born July 15, 1850, in the St. Angelo, Luciano, Italy. After taking vows to become a nun in 1877, she began teaching them at an orphanage in Codogno, Italy. In 1889, Pope Leo, Pope Leo VIII, uh, XIII sent her to New York to begin ministering to the growing number of new immigrants in the United States. She became a naturalized U.S. citizen in 1909. Through her lifetime, Cabrini worked with all those in need, including the poor, the uneducated, and the sick. She helped organize schools, orphanages, and adult education classes for immigrants in her nearly 40 years of ministry. In 1946, Pope Pius uh, XII uh, canonized her, making her the first U.S. citizen to be canonized. Cabrini is now the Catholic Church patron saint of immigrants. Michael Pupin American physicist and inventor. Pupin was born October 4th. Let me show you the photo that there's listed here for Francis X. Cabrini. Cabrini. <coughs> uh, Michael Pupin, 1858-1935. 
American physicist and inventor. Kupin was born October 4, 1858 in Eidmore, Australia, Australia, Hungary, now Serbia. Austria-Hungary, now Serbia, in 1874. He moved to the United States, settling New York. Pupin graduated from Columbia University with a degree in phys physics in 1883. He became a naturalized U.S. citizen that same year. In 1889, Pupin obtained his doctorate from the University of Berlin. Upon graduating, he returned to Col Columbia University, where he taught for, for more than 40 years. Pupin was well known for his improvement of long-distance telephone and telegraph communications. Throughout his career, he received 34 patents for his inventions. In 1924, he won the Pulitzer Prize for his autobiography, From Immigrant to Inventor. Uh, Solomon Carter Fuller, 1872-1953. American uh, psychiatrist, first known Amer African-American psychiatrist in the United States. Uh, Fuller was born in Monrovia, Fuller was, okay, Fuller was born in Monrovia, Liberia, in 1872. In 1889, he moved to the United States to attend Livingston College in Salisbury, North Carolina. He received his MD from Boston University School of Medicine in 1894 and began teaching there in 1899. Fuller spent a year in Munich, Germany, studying psychiatry. Much, much of his research centered on degenerative brain diseases, including Alzheimer's disease, which he attributed to the causes other than uh, RT, arteriosclerosis, a theory that was fully supported by medical researchers in 1953. Fuller became a naturalized U.S. citizen in 1920. Albert, okay, let's see photos. Michael Deacon. And you have the doctor. You have Einstein, which we're going to be reading about now. Albert Einstein, 1879-1955. American scientist and Nobel laureate in physics, widely considered to be the greatest scientist of the 20th century. Uh, Einstein was born March 14, 1879, at home in Wurttemberg, Germany. In 1921, he received the Nobel Prize in Physics for his discovery of the law of the photoelectric effect. Einstein's special theory of, relati of relativity contain containing the famous equation E equals mc squared also won him international praise. When the Nazis came to power in Germany in 1933, he emigrated to the United States and joined the newly formed Institute for Advanced Studies at the Princeton University. Einstein became a naturalized U.S. citizen in 1940. Igor Stravinsky, 1882-1971, uh, American composer. Um, Stravinsky was born June 17, 1882, in Oranium Or Bum, Russia, now Lomonosov, Russia. His early career was spent composing in Switzerland, Paris, and France. Uh, Stravinsky's works include The Rite of Spring, 1913, The Soldier's Tale, 1918, Odia Pius Rex, 1927, and Persephone, 1934. In 1939, he left Europe and settled in the United States. Stravinsky became a naturalized U.S. citizen in 1945. The various styles of music he experimented with made Stravinsky one of the most influential composers of, of his time. He is now widely regarded as one of the greatest composers of the 20th century. Felix Frank Frutter, 1882-1965, American legal scholar and a U.S. Supreme Court justice. Frank Frutter was born November 1580, in, uh, born November 15, 1882, in Vienna, Australia, Hungary, now Australia, Austria, Hungary, now Australia, Austria. In 1894, he immigrated to the United States and attended both City College of New York and Harvard Law School. By virtue of his father's naturalization, Frank Furter became a naturalized U.S. citizen. 
He went on to serve as an assistant U.S. attorney in New York State, 1906-1910, and a legal officer in the Bureau of Insular Affairs, 1911-1914. From 1914 to 1939, Frankfurter was a professor at Harvard Law School. In 1939, President Franklin, Franklin D. Roosevelt appointed him as an associate justice to the U.S. Supreme Court. Knut Rockne, 1888 to 1931. American football player and coach, Rockne was born March 4, 1888 in Voss, Norway. His father brought the family to the United States in 1893. By virtue of his father's naturalization, Rockne became a naturalized U.S. citizen in 1896. As the, head of foot, as the head football coach of the University of Notre Dame from 1918 to 1930, he achieved the greatest winning percentage of all time at 0.881%. During his years as head coach, Rockne collected 105 victories, 12 losses, 5 ties, and 6 national championships. He also coached Notre Dame to five undefeated seasons. Both as a player and as a coach, Rockney popularized the use of the forward pass, which significantly changed how the game was played. Knut Rockney seated at a Notre Dame football practice in the late 1920s. Irving Berlin. Uh, let me show you some photos of uh, Felix. And then. Irene Bell. An American composer and songwriter, Berlin was born May 11, 1888, in Mogilov, Russia, now in Belarus, in 1893. His family emigrated to the United States. He became a naturalized U.S. citizen in 1918. Berlin wrote music and lyrics for Broadway shows such as Annie Get, Get Your Gun, 1946, and Miss Liberty, 1949, as well as for, for the films such as The Holiday Inn, 1942, Blue Skies, 1946, and Easter Parade, 1948. He also wrote popular songs such as There's No Business Like Show Business, God Bless America, and the holiday classic White Christmas. In 1955, President Dwight D. Eisenhower recognized Berlin's patriotic songs by presenting him with a special medal authorized by the U.S. Congress. In, 18, in 1986, Berlin was one of the 12 naturalized U.S. citizens to receive the Medal of Liberty from President Ronald Reagan. Uh, Frank Capra, 1897-1991. American film director and producer, Capra was born May 18, 1897 in Palermo, Italy. In 1903, his family immigrated to the United States, settling in Los Angeles. He became a naturalized U.S. citizen in 1920. Capra is known for directing such films as Mis Mr. Smith, Goes to Washington, 1939, It's a Wonderful Life, 1946, and Mr. Deed, Mr. Deeds Goes to Town, 1936 for which he won the Academy Award for Best Director. Although it was considered a box office failure upon its release, his 1946 film, It's a Wonderful Life, had become one of the most beloved holiday films of all time. Uh, Dalip Singh Sond. American congressman and first Asian American to serve in the U.S. Congress. Sond was born September 20th, 1899 in Chao Wadi, Punjab, India. He graduated from the University of Punjab in 1919 and moved to the United States the following year to attend the University of California. Sand earned both a master's degree and a doctorate from the University of California. He then became a successful lettuce farmer in the Imperial Valley of California. He became a naturalist, naturalized U.S. citizen in 1949. In 1952, Sand was elected judge of justice court for the Westmoreland Judicial District of California's Imperial County, a position he was denied two years earlier because he had not been a U.S. citizen for more than a year. In 1956, he was elected to represent the 29th Congressional District of California in, in the United States House of Representatives, becoming the first Asian American to serve in the U.S. United States Congress. Marlene 
diet rich, 1901 to 1992. American actress and singer uh, Diet Rich was born December 27, 1901 in Berlin, Germany. She began her acting career in Berlin, which where she quickly became popular in the theater and in silent films. In 1929, she was cast in the film The Blue Angel, 1930, by American director Joseph von Sternberg. Her performance was widely acclaimed and Diatrip promptly moved to the United States. She starred in a variety of films during her career, including Morocco, 1930, The Devil is a Woman, 1935, The Desire, 1936, and Judgment at Nuremberg, 1961. She became a naturalized United States citizen in 1939. During World War II, Diet Rich made over 500 appearances before American troops overseas. Bob Hope, 1903-2003 uh, American entertainer, Hope was born May 29, 1903 in uh, Eltham, Great Britain. In 1907, his father moved the family to Cleveland, Ohio. In 1920, by virtue of his father's naturalization, Bob, the name he took for the rest of his life, became a U.S. citizen. Throughout his career, he appeared in a variety of films and television specials and performed many shows for the American troops overseas, including World War II, 1939-1945, the Korean War, 1950-1953, uh, the Vietnam War, 1959-1975, the Persian Gulf War, 1991. In 1997, in 1997, the President William Clinton named him an honorary military veteran. Subrayam Chandra Sekhar. Uh, 1910 to 1995. American scientist and Nobel laureate uh, Chandraskar was born October 19, 1910 in Lahore, India, now Pakistan. He earned a bachelor's degree in physics at Presidency College in Madras, India, and a, doctor, and a doctorate from Trinity College in England. Chandraskar immigrated to the United States in 1937, where he joined the faculty of the University of Chicago. He became a naturalized U.S. citizen in 1953. Chandra Sekhar was the first to theorize that not all stars end up as a white dwarf stars, but those retaining mass above a certain limit known today as Chandraskar's limit undergo further collapse. In 1983, he was awarded the Nobel Prize in Physics for his theoretic, uh, theoretical studies of the, uh, of the th physical processes important to the structure and evolution of stars. In 1999, the natural uh, Aeronautics and Space Administration, NASA, named one of its four great observatories orbiting the Earth and space for Chandra Sekhar. Kenneth B. Clark, 1914-2005. to American psychologist Clark was born July 14, 1914 in the Panama Canal Zone. In 1919, he moved to the United States, settling in New York with his mother and sister. He became a naturalized U.S. citizen in 1931. Clark obtained a bachelor's degree from Harvard University in 1935 and a master's degree in 1936. He went on to earn a doctorate in experimental psychology from Columbia University in 1940, becoming the first African American to earn a doctorate in psychology at the school. In 1946, he and his wife Mamie founded Morphside Center for Child Development in Harlem, New York, where they began conducting research on racial bias in education. A 1950 report from Clark on racial discrimination was cited in the landmark Brown vs. the Board of Education Supreme Court decision which ruled the public school segregation unconstitutional. Clark was also the first African American to serve as the president of the American Psychological Association. In 1986, he was one of the 12 naturalized U.S. citizens to receive the Medal of Liberty from President Ronald Reagan. Celia Cruz, 1929 to 2003. Uh, this was Kenneth B. Clark. And we're doing Celia Cruz right now. Uh, American singer known as the Queen of Salsa. Mm -hmm. Cruz was born October 21st, 1925. 
in Juana, Cuba. She became famous in Cuba in the, in the 1950s, singing with the band Las Sonarora Matanzara. Cruz left Cuba for the United States in 1960 after Fidel Castro came to power. She was soon headlining to Hollywood, uh, headlining the Hollywood Palladium in California and Carnegie Hall in New York. Cruz became a naturalized U.S. citizen in 1961. She appeared in several films, including The Mambo Kings, 1992, The Perez Family, 1995, and Sanya Duet with David Byrne for the 1986 film Something Wild. Uh, during her long career, Cruz received the Smithsonian Lifetime Achievement Award, the National Medal of the Arts, and an honorary doctorate from Yale University and the University of Miami. We have just a random photo. <coughs> Acknowledgements. U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services and the Office of Citizenship would like to extend its appreciation to the following organizations for their support and assistance in the development of this publication. The Center for Civic Education, National Endowment, Endowment for the Humanities, National Constitution Center, U.S. CIS Historical Reference Library, Marilyn Zoids, formerly Senior Curator, Star Spangled Banner Project, Smithsonian Institution's National Museum of American History, And then here's a quote. Our nation is not bound together by the common ties of blood, race, and religion. We are united instead of our devotion to shared ideals. So each generation of Americans, both native born and immigrants, must learn our great founding principles, how our institutions came into being, how they work, and what our rights and responsibilities are. For this reason, the National Endowment for the Humanities is proud to support the development of the Citizens' Almanac. This valuable resource will help new Americans become educated and thoughtful citizens who can fully participate in a government of, by, and for the people. And then there's something with uh, Abraham Lincoln. With malice towards none, with charity for all, with firmness in the right, as God gives us to see the right. Let us strive on to finish the work we are in, to bind up the nation's wounds, to care for him who shall have borne the battle, and for his widow and his orphan, and to do all which may achieve and cherish a, ju cherish a just and a lasting peace among ourselves and with all nations. And then I, I just want to read the back of it, just just see what, see what else is there. Americans by birth or by choice, we are all united by the common civic values expressed in our founding documents, the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution of the United States. This common civic identity binds us together as one nation, the Citizens' Almanac, a, collect a collection of America's most cherished symbols of freedom and liberty, serves as the modern-day lifeline to a rich civic history, from historic speeches to landmark Supreme Court decisions. The Citizens Almanac offers a fascinating look into the fundamental civic values that helped shape the country we know today. In the Citizens Almanac, both native-born and naturalized citizens will find important information on the rights and responsibilities associated with United States citizenship. Becoming an active participant in our system of government further strengthens our democracy. As a former Supreme Court Justice Louis Brandeis said, the only title in our democracy superior to that of president is the title of citizen. So, through civic participation and further learning about our country, its founding ideals, achievements, and history, America's newest generation of citizens will enjoy the fruits of responsible citizenship for years to come. It's done. I hopefully uh, uh, somebody benefits from this and watch the whole thing. Uh, I know it's long, three hours long, probably. Yeah. Uh, I wanted to read it just fully straight through. Uh, I thought maybe I should maybe keep it somehow, uh, bring some sort of entertainment to it from time to time to make it maybe, um, maybe maybe 
to make it more enjoyable for some people, but I thought that would take away from the value of it. Uh, it's just maybe some value. Uh, just make it a purely educational thing. Uh, so, that's that. Uh, if you live in the United States and you want to get your hands on this, just for reference, maybe to give to a friend, This was made by the United States Citizenship and Immigration Services, so uh, they have that in every state, so maybe if you go there, I don't know. I emailed them to see if they, I could have more copies, if I have to find out what happens to that, but uh, if I actually get any copies, I'd be more than willing to ship out copies of this. That's that. Good luck.